be glad in it as always. So good to see each other here this morning. God has something special for each one of you. However many people we've got here today, God's going to say something specific just for you today, even though it's the same message, the same music, the same prayers that you'll all be hearing. So tune in and let God speak to you this morning. Right now, let's take our hymn books and let's join our hearts and voices together in song. We're going to turn to number 632. Stand as you're able, and we're going to sing, Lead on, O King Eternal. Stand as you're able. Trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm glad to see everybody this morning. I'm feeling good, much better than I was. And you all are happy this morning. <coughs> Except for Bonnie, I'm going to do this about that sad face. He's getting on the chair. Uh, the, where I've been reading from this morning is Jeremiah 1 4 through 10. The, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Behold, I formed you in the womb I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to root and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
take care of our, our leaders in our country, educate them in some way to be, be our Christian nation we used to be. Lord, we also, we ask for forgiveness of all our many sins of this past week. We ask you to guide us and direct us in everything that we do and say. Forgive us of our many sins. Again, as I ask, Christ, I will pray. Amen.
that your son gave us to represent his body. I was going to be killed on the cross for our salvation. And our salvation for all who believe. In Christ's name we pray. As with the bread, he also took out the cup, <coughs> passed it around.
bread around to represent his body. He also took the cup of wine and passed it around, as I said before. And when he said, when you drink this, remember it's my blood, do so in remembrance of me. Oh, 
Well, if you have, then you know something about the church in the wild and crazy city of Corinth. It was like 2,000 some odd years ago when Paul wrote that letter that we read a part of this morning just now to them. That it, most of the believers in Corinth were extremely excited about their faith. There were people in that community with tremendous gifts. There were people in Corinth who were teachers. There were people in Corinth who were healers, those who could speak in tongues, those who could lead worship, those who were preachers, those who had the ministry of helping and visitation, others who could prophesy, as we read. And the Word of God was proclaimed every day, and they prayed. Very important thing. And the gospel message itself was wonderful. The Word said that Jesus had risen from the dead and that all who believed in Him would receive forgiveness and they would live eternally in His heavenly kingdom. Everything you needed was there. Every ingredient that you needed for a vital church and a growing faith community was there. But there was one thing. That church failed the taste <coughs> test. It didn't have enough sugar in it. Or if you'll let me define sugar a different way, it didn't have enough love in it. How many of you here as moms or grandmas ever said, give me a little sugar? What you mean? Give me a little love. Give me a little tap on the cheek. That's what sugar is. Sugar is love. And that's what it didn't have enough of, the church of Corinth. It had everything else, but it didn't have enough sugar. It didn't have enough love. The 13th chapter of Corinthians is probably the favorite wedding text of all time. When I lay all the verses out there, when I meet with a couple that I'm going to marry, and I say, what would you like to have me read as far as Scripture? They all look over that and go, oh, I love that. It talks about everything that we want for our wedding. I think every wedding couple in the Christian world has it read during their ceremony. And it is a wonderful chapter. But you know what? When Paul wrote it, he wasn't thinking a whole lot about weddings, nor was he even really trying to describe what love is like, though it does do that. But rather, he was trying to show the, the Corinthians that in the end, nothing matters more to the answer the question, are you living out the love of Christ? Love. The kind of love that God has for us, that's the yardstick. That's the measure of our faith. And the folk in Corinth seemed a little lacking in something in the love department. Despite all that wonderful things that they were doing, despite all the spiritual wisdom that seemed to be in their place, despite all of the faith that they claimed to have, there were some strange things going on. Let me tell you about it. The man who was sleeping with his stepmother, the two elders who had dragged each other off to court instead of making peace to one another. Some folk didn't really believe all that well at the meals that they held in memory of Jesus. Some ate too much, some drank too much while others in the crowd went hungry. And then too, and this was really troubling, there were the public disagreements that they had about which the apostles and the teachers, the ones that had come to Corinth, they were arguing about which one was the best and which ones were the worst. And there were some folks who believed that their contribution to their community of faith was more significant than the other. That their views on things should be considered first because of that. While others felt that they weren't important to the church or to God at all. Because they didn't have the gifts or the talents maybe that somebody else had. They couldn't all teach or they couldn't all preach or they couldn't all play an instrument maybe. So they felt like, well, I'm not worth anything to this, to this community. In short, the people in Corinth were at times rude to another. Impatient, arrogant, greedy, selfish, egotistical, unkind. This even though they had otherwise displayed some very wonderful traits of the faith community, some spiritual gifts that were wonderful. This even though people were healed at their meetings were told and the word of God was proclaimed and they were clothing people and they were feeding people. It's a hard word to hear at times when we read from the book of 1 Corinthians concerning love. Think about what it says. What it does say, if I boil it down, it doesn't matter if you speak out for God, if you know all the mysteries, if you can heal all the diseases, if you do all that and you don't have any love, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have faith enough to say, move mountain, and it moves. If you don't have love, 
you or nothing. You've heard it before, my friends, probably from every preacher or pastor that you've ever listened to. But hear it again and hopefully hear it fresh. Love is the test of our faith. Folks know we are Christians by our love. There's a song by that title. And they know that we're something less than fully Christian in what we claim to be if we have a lack of that love. What is love besides being the touchstone of our attitudes and our actions? If we're doing all those great things, but we don't have any love in our hearts, then we're being disgenuine to ourselves and disgenuine to God. So love involves seeking the highest good for God's creation. God first, neighbor second, and ourself last. Love is being more interested in the well-being of others than our own. It's making sacrifices. It's seeing everyone through the lens of Christ and treating them like Christ has treated us. What happens when somebody around us falls? Now, I'm not talking about literally, but I'm talking about the moral sense. Be it a friend, a co-worker, a neighbor, a fellow church member even. When somebody fails and falls morally, do we react with love? Do we offer counsel? Do we offer forgiveness? Or do we respond with ridicule? Do we respond with tasteless jokes, laughter, finger pointing, I told you so's, or worse, do we gather together in our little cliques and groups and talk about what's happened and encourage others to do so as well? Too often when this happens in the, in the community and definitely, but even in the church, even in the faith community, pastors and laypersons alike, I'll say, we focus on the wrong that was done and we never venture down the path of reconciliation, of restoration. The Bible speaks to that all the way through. That's what God did for us. We were, of all things, most unworthy of His gift. But He forgave us. He reconciled us up to Himself. And He gave us that opportunity for the gift of life eternal. In all of these exchanges, there's a failure of love. A failure that undermined the value of all the wonderful gifts that those people there at Corinth had. And that all of these people that we condemn surely have positive things that they bring to their churches and congregations. But yet we ostracize them. And we don't ever get on that path to reconciliation. Quite simply, they were not rejoicing in the right, but they were rejoicing in the wrong. A wagging of tongues that didn't fulfill any biblical commands to pray for those in authority or to remove the log in our eye before we comment about the speck or the splinter in someone else's, as the Scripture says. That behavior, no matter how well intended it is, is never Christ-guided or Christ-centered. It brings shame and division to the body of Christ. Why is that, preacher, you say? Because it lacks love. That failure in the love test in matters like that is not universal, of course. And not even those believers who fail that particular love test fail the love test in other matters. But some of the times it's still significant for them and for us. We do fail the test of love sometimes, don't we, if we're honest with ourselves. We fail it as individuals and we fail it as the church as a whole. And we should be concerned about that. We shouldn't take our lapses lightly. And I say lapses because it is about us that the love test is all about. It's not for me to judge you. It's not for you to judge me. Rather, it is for us to look at ourselves and ask, am I focused on living a Christ-like life myself? Am I showing the love of God to others myself? Doing what Jesus would do here. Allowing Christ to work through me. Or am I allowing my feelings, my frustrations, my needs, my pride, my talent to dominate all my interactions with other people? And the way that comes across to other people is, wow, they're kind of self-centered. They don't have a lot of love in them. Love is the test of our faith, and it's the test of our faith community. And it's the test of each one of our lives. 
As I have always told you, we, each one of us here, like the Corinthians, are incredibly <coughs> gifted by God. We have so many talents and spiritual gifts here in our church that we can do so much, so many great things and so much for our community. We have those who sing praise to God. We have those that create art and uh, make us consider God's talents and true beauty. We have those who can play music. We have those who learn the Word of God and share it with others. We have those who comfort others with well-timed phone calls, love gift baskets as well. We have those who have the gifts of prayer and evangelism and service. And I could go on and on and on. We are gifted. And I think our love quotient here is pretty high. We hug we, when it's not flu season. <laughs> we bless one another. We appreciate one another. We welcome everybody that walks in the door without fail. But are we quite there yet? We have to Step back and take stock of ourselves. Are we quite there? Have we reached the peak of what our faith says we should be about? Have we managed to fulfill all that Christ asks of us? And when we follow Him, are we made fully over in the image of Christ? So let's take the test. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything, but listen to this and kind of answer for yourself. Do we compare what we do for the church to what others are or not doing? Do we ever speak out about how some folk just seem to take up space as if somehow the value of what we're doing is greater than what they're doing? Do we ever think some folk are better than we are and we don't feel quite as good about what we do for the Lord? Do we call down some of our neighbors and build up others? Do we treat those who are slower than we are with impatience and less reverence? Think about that one when you're driving down 581 and going somewhere at your on the time schedule, right? There is always more growing to do. However you answer those questions, we've all, like I said, we're not here to judge, but we've all got a journey to live, amen? And we've all got work to do, myself included. You know, if I, the old preacher told me one time, I ever point at y'all, he said, don't take offense because when I get through, the thumb's coming back at me. I like that. There's always more growing to do. So listen, I want you to put your name in today's passage from Corinthians where love is described. I want you to think about yourself and see just how much you agree with it and how much more traveling maybe we each need to do on the road to spiritual growth and understanding. Listen, this is about you and me as God's children. I want you to listen as I read this passage about what love is like to you. Insert your name every time you hear me say the word love. Love is patient. <coughs> Love is kind. Love is not envious. It is not boastful, arrogant, or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice when others do wrong, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. And love endures all things. That's quite powerful, isn't it, when you stop and do that? <coughs> trying to say all that about yourself once in a while and saying it, trying to avoid the words most of the time, or almost always. Now consider Jesus and how he fits into that picture of what love is like. He can help us be like him. He abides in us. That's what our faith is about. How he is here in this world. He's in this church. He's in each and every one of us who believe in him. He's in my heart and yours. He abides in us and calls us to abide or live in him. And the way we do that is to be focused on him and his example. What was the catchphrase that was popular a number of years ago? What would Jesus do? That's, I know it's gotten cliche now because you hear it all the time. It's printed on everything. But it really is a good phrase. Anytime I go to do anything in my life, if you ask, what would Jesus do? Would he do this or not? It's a good, it's a good measure. Your salvation doesn't depend on how well you do these things. It does depend on, it does not depend on you becoming perfect. That's the exact mess, opposite of the message of love that we proclaim. God says, come to me just as you are, and I'll do the rest. 
in a wonderful little book called Pocket Full of Miracles. I'll close with this today. It's a daily devotional. Uh, the author, Joan Lorenzo, under January 31st, just a couple days, a few days ago, she wrote this. Shakespeare said, pretend you have a virtue even if you don't. Most of us are still locked up in the petty, self-centered concerns of our egos. Nonetheless, we feel that ancient longing of our soul to move beyond our ego to unite with the divine. It doesn't matter if our motivation to unite with the divine falters or if selfish concerns predominate. If we just pretend the virtue of longing for God and of being service to other, <coughs> others, eventually those virtues will arise spontaneously. She said, as my husband puts it, fake it till you make it. If you don't feel loving, do the right thing in love anyway. You don't feel like being kind, stay at home. No, I'm just kidding. Say the right thing and say the kind thing anyway. Amen? If you don't think that somebody else's plan is going to work and you think my plan's better, rather than jumping up and down in the meeting and waving your hand and calling them down, maybe give their plan a try. Do you think you can possibly do what God's calling you to do? Even if you don't? Even if you're like Moses, you say, I'm just not worthy. Do it anyway. Try it anyway. Fake it till you make it. Nothing wrong with that. Or as Paul puts it, earnestly strive for the greater gifts. The greatest of these is love. Strive for it. Amen? And live as if you have it right now. For in truth you do. God has put it in you. We just have to work with Him to bring it out to the surface a little bit sometimes. Christ died to bring it to you and me and to show us what it's like. And He rose from the dead on the third day to show that its power is greater than the power of sin. So when you confess Christ as your Lord, God comes and He abides in you and He gives you that ability to abide in Him and abide in His love. And you know how you do it? You do it one minute at a time, one day at a time, one month at a time, one year at a time. Don't be overwhelmed because you haven't done it all today. But keep on striving. Turn to God. Ask Him to help you pass the love tests each minute of every day and ask Him to abide in you as you seek to abide in Him. That's all we can do, folks. Let's pray. Father God, You are so forgiving, so loving, so worthy. You help us, Father, each and every day, even when we become frustrated, when we feel like we're just not accomplishing anything, when we feel like the gears are spinning backwards, when we feel like we haven't accomplished anything for You in the course of the day. You still love us. You still care for us. And you still seek to put us back on that right and narrow path. We thank you for that. Father, we thank you for this message that has gone forth today. We pray, Lord, that it has uh, fallen on our fertile soils of our hearts and that it will, Lord, grow, produce much fruit, and we'll be taken out into the world this week, Lord, and share it with others. There are so many hurting people around us, Lord. Help us to seek them out and help us to always be ready to love them, no matter what it is they've done, no matter where it is they've been. Let them know that we only care where they're headed. Lord, we ask you to bless us now as we close this service. Be with that one who needs to make a decision for thee. Be with those who are not here today due to health concerns. Heal them to those who are traveling, traveling mercy. And Father, we'll just give you all the thanks, honor, and praise for everything that was accomplished here today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is number 557. We're going to sing together just a closer walk with thee. If you have anything to share with the church, be it salvation, rededication of your life, church membership, prayer for something particular that's on your heart and mind, step out and someone will be here with you in the front and we'll rejoice along with you. Number 557.
his kingdom. May he follow you and guide you every step of your way as you go out into the world this week to share his love with everyone. Appreciate each and every one of you. Love you all. And if you need me for any reason this week, give me a call. Remember, if you're going next Sunday afternoon to the district meeting, let me know by Tuesday, and I'll call the number in on Wednesday. And we'd love to have some of you go if you'd like to. We'll have a great time. Uh, right now, let's respond with our commissioning statement. That's for the area of I'll give our benediction. And then we will sing our response. I'll put it up here. In the power of the risen Lord, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.